Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Can I ask everyone in the room, please ensure mobile phones are off or on silent and while mobile devices may be used for social media purposes, they should not be used for photography or for recording proceedings. We have received apologies today from Alex Cole Hamilton and from David Torrance uh, and we're joined today by Bob Doris, a substitute member for uh, David Torrance. Welcome. Uh, the first item of the agenda is continued consideration of stage two of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. I welcome once again Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman, who is again accompanied by Diane Murray, Louise Kay, Julie Davidson and Jonathan Brown. Uh, welcome officials to the table and also welcome Monica Lennon, who I know will be moving amendments and in due course, uh, uh, and in due course we will have Mike Rumbles also to move our amendments and I welcome also to Fiona McLean, who is accompanying uh, the Minister. Thank you very much. Um, everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the Marshall List of Amendments published on Thursday, and the groupings of amendments which set, the out, set them out in the order in which they will de be debated. Uh, I'm glad to welcome uh, members of the public to join us today. I will briefly explain the procedure. Uh, once again, there will be a debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodges the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment and to speak to all the other amendments in the group. I will then call any other members who have lodged amendments in that group. Uh, and members who have not lodged the am amendments may also contribute, simply catch my eye in the usual way. Uh, I will invite the Cabinet Secretary to contribute to the debate if she's not already done so just before, before I move to winding up. And I will then move to the winding up speech by the initial, the mover of the initial uh, amendment. Following debate on each group, the, the mover of the amendment should indicate whether they wish to press uh, the amendment to a vote or to withdraw. I will then put the question on that amendment if they do wish to press ahead. If a member wishes to withdraw, that must be agreed by other members, so if any member present objects, the amendment will immediately be put to the vote. Uh, if, when called, a member does not move, wish to move an amendment, they should say not moved. It is open to any other member of the committee to move that amendment. Uh, if no one does so, I will immediately move to the next amendment on the Marshall list. So a reminder that only committee members and substitute members uh, may vote. Voting in any division is by show of hands, and I would ask members to indicate their intention clearly and keep their hand up until their vote has been recorded. Uh, the vote, the committee is required also to formally approve each section of the bill uh, on completion of amendments in that section, so there will also, I will also put a question on that at the appropriate point. Now, the intention is, if we can today, to finish uh, consideration of stage two of the bill. Clearly, if we're unable to do so, we will return uh, to it after the February recess, but I would uh, uh, indicate at this stage that we have uh, approximately three hours set aside for completion of these proceedings today, and I hope we can get through it. Can, uh, on that basis, we should move straight away to um, uh, Amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which is grouped with Amendments 93 and 22 on the Common Staffing Method, Purpose and Frequency of Use. And can I call the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 18? Thank you, Convener, and good morning to you and to members. Uh, Amendments 18 and 22 relate to the frequency of use of the common staffing method in Section 12IB. The common staffing method includes the use of staffing level and professional judgment tools and consideration of the results they produce. Section 12IB3C provides Scottish ministers with a power to prescribe the frequency of use of the staffing level and professional judgment tools as part of the common staffing method. It does not allow ministers to prescribe the frequency of use of the common staffing method as a whole. The data output produced as a result of using these tools should only be used as part of the common staffing method and should not be used in isolation, and vice versa. The common staffing method should not be used without the using the tools and the data output from them. It is therefore the Scottish Government's intention that the whole common staffing method, as set out in Section 12IB, should be used at a specified frequency and not just the tools. Upon reflection, therefore, the Scottish Government considers that the power in 12IB3C is too narrow to achieve this intention, since it relates only to the frequency of use of the tools and not the wider common staffing method. Accordingly, Amendment 22 
removes section 12IB3C, whilst Amendment 18 sets out a replacement power for Scottish ministers to prescribe in regulations the frequency at which the common staffing method as a whole, and not just the tools, is to be used. It is also worth underlining that this will be a minimum frequency. Health boards will have the discretion to use the common staffing method more often if they wish. As well as providing clarity that Scottish ministers can specify the frequency with which the whole common staffing method should be used, and not just the tools, these amendments should also remove any possible suggestion that the output of the tools can be used separately from the common staffing method, or that the common staffing method can be followed without using the data from the output of the tools. Turning now to Mr Briggs' Amendment 93, which seeks to set out the purpose of the common staffing method is to set staffing establishments. Although the common staffing method is used to set staffing establishments, this is not its only purpose. It is designed to be used more widely. Indeed, the bill already reflects its wider use as a method to support service redesign. This is set out as a specific step in 12IB2D. If we were to say that the common staffing method was purely about setting a staffing establishment on an annual basis, then the opportunity created by this legislation is being missed, and we would just be making the voluntary use of the existing tools a statutory requirement. Throughout the consultation on this legislation, we were told that this needs to go beyond just looking at how the establishment is set. The common staffing method set out in this legislation does just that, and restricting it to uh, that uh, in terms of establishment only really undermines the purpose of the legislation. However, whilst I do not believe that Amendment 93 accurately conveys the range of uses for which the common staffing method can bring benefits, it's worth noting that these other uses do lead to the setting of an establishment figure and would therefore be captured within the purpose set out in Amendment 93. Therefore, I will not oppose it, although I would ask Mr Briggs to confirm that his intention behind this amendment is to cover not only the routine regular staffing establishment setting process, but also its use to provide an establishment figure as a result of other triggers, such as the need to redesign a service. With that, convener, I move Amendment 18. Thank you very much. I can I call on Miles Briggs. <coughs> Thank you, amendment convener, 90. and good morning to everybody. Um, my Amendment 93 uh, looks to designate the common staffing method as the process by which a staffing establishment uh, figure is actually set. In the bill as drafted, the common st staffing me method is the only process used to set staffing levels. The staffing tool and professional judgment tool are required to be run as the first step of the common staffing method. If current practice is followed, the two tools will be run and in almost all cases on an annual or biannual basis. In some specific settings, uh, like neonatal, for example, the staffing tool would be run on a daily uh, basis if current practice continues. Um, given the steps which the common staffing method requires, it's a way to set a staffing establishment figure, and that's what I've been uh, looking to try to incorporate as well. And it's, it's not a real-time process to monitor staffing um, safety or quality. Um, so I've heard what the Cabinet Secretary says and think that uh, the amendment still could complement the overall bill uh, going forward. Thank you very much. If, uh, Sandra White. Thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of questions and perhaps a comment uh, to, to the Minister. I thank the Minister for clarifying the position of uh, Amendment 18, uh, particularly around the frequency. Uh, it is absolutely you know, in my mind anyway, that we're moving more towards integration and this is part of it. Uh, and that's why I'm concerned. Some of the amendments that has came forward, some clar clarity on that particular amendment. Uh, could I just ask Miles Briggs in regard to, and I know the Minister says she's minded to accept uh, that amendment, uh, but we're looking at service redesign and flexibility, which is what this bill is all about. Can I ask Miles Briggs, would there be any, any way possible this amendment that you're putting forward would stop this uh, going forward, the flexibility and the service redesign? Because that, that is my concern in regards to this amendment. Um, I indicate that if Mr Briggs wishes to uh, respond to that, he would have to make an intervention either on Sandra White or on the Minister in due course. Thank you. In, 
In terms of um, the wider context of health and social care integration, I think that's what is important uh, behind this bill, which I think all committee members are actually um, committed to. And what I've been looking forward uh, looking for within this amendment is actually to look to how we can strengthen the bill as drafted around common staffing methods. Um, as, it, as currently, that's the only process used in establishing, yeah. establishing staffing levels. Would you take an interview? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Oh, I saw, sorry. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, convener. Yeah, that, that's a point I want to clarify in myself and uh, hopefully for others also. You quite rightly said it is you know, the long term and it's very difficult to get that. But I did ask about service redesign and flexibility. Would this amendment stop the service redesign that has been proposed and the flexibility of staffing? That You haven't answered that to me. I don't believe it would, so. It wouldn't stop. Thank you very much. I think that concludes Ms White's contribution. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up? Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I have very little to add. I'm grateful for uh, Mr Briggs' confirmation that he doesn't intend that his amendment would uh, restrict or prevent service redesign. Uh, and with that uh, assurance, uh, then I, I press Amendment 18 and I uh, will not stand in the way of Mr Briggs' amendment. Thank you very much. That's clear. Can I, the question then is that Amendment 18 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And I call Amendment 93 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 18. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Uh, moved. Moved. The question then is, um, that, uh, is that Amendment 93 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Move on to the next group. Common staffing methods, steps and factors in method. Uh, can I start by calling Amendment 94 in the name of Miles Briggs, group with the amendments as shown in the, brief, in the groupings. Miles Briggs to move Amendment 94 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, let me just get my. I move all amendments 94, 95, 97, 99, 100, and 101. Um, the purpose of these is to remove the hierarchy uh, within the common staffing method so that tools, patient acuity, and dependency, and the clinical advice of nurses of appropriate seniority are given equal weight. The current common staffing method is based on average workload for each speciality across Scotland. It's supplemented by considering the uh, specifics of local context, including the age profile of staff, local recruitment challenges, quality indicators, and professional judgment. As drafted, the use of a staffing level tool and the professional judgment tool are the first step. Taking into account current staffing levels, local context, and so on must be taken into account next. Then patient need and appropriate clinical advice are taken into account. This means that within the common staffing method, the tools hold more weight than patient need and, and the clinical advice of nurses of appropriate seniority, as such a common staffing method is, truly, is not truly triangulated. The process set out by the common st staffing method should give, I believe, equal weight to the use of staffing tools, patient acuity and dependency, and the cl clinical advice of nurses of appropriate seniority. When the committee took evidence on this, we were looking specifically um, at a piece of work around um, ultimate focus on outcomes to be achieved. Uh, I believe these amendments help to complement the bill in, in that. Thank you very much. Uh, can, I, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in this group? Uh, thank you, Convener. convener. Um, uh, in starting, I would speak to uh, <coughs> amendments, in particular Amendment 20, uh, I addressed this amendment in part last week, uh, and I don't intend to repeat everything I said then. I would like to point out, uh, however, that in developing this amendment, I listened to the views of the RCN uh, that the leadership role of the senior charge nurse should be recognised. This is something that was covered by the Leading Better Care Review back in 2008, which set out that in recognition of their leadership role, senior charge nurses should not be completely caseload ho holding. The leadership role of the senior charge nurse is something we will continue to work on, and the workload planning tools and common staffing method provide an evidence-based way to do so. I do not, however, feel that it is appropriate that nurses have been singled out for preferential treatment in a bill which is not only about nursing. And having looked further at Alison Johnson's Amendment 91, which was passed last week, 
I am not convinced that this does what she intended it to do, and I have some serious concerns about the way that is worded and the impact that it could potentially have on patient care, and we'll return to this uh, later in the process. My Amendment 20 aims to recognise the unique roles and responsibilities which are placed on all clinical team leaders by setting out an additional step in the common staffing method which requires health boards to consider the role and professional duties of lead clinical professionals. As such, this amendment takes account of the multidisciplinary nature of the services that we aim to provide, as it would, for example, mean that in a rehabilitation ward, if the team leader was a physiotherapist, then that person would be allowed <clears throat> appropriate time to fulfil their leadership role. It will also mean that midwives are afforded the same support for their leadership role as nurses. That is important, perhaps even more so, uh, given the passing of Amendment 91, <clears throat> to ensure that all staff groups are supported in their leadership role. The Scottish Executive Nurse Directors Group are also supportive of this approach, which they believe clearly articulates the role of the clinical leader in the common staffing method. With this in mind, I would ask the committee to support this amendment. Amendment 19 sets out that as part of the common staffing methods, health, health boards and the agency must take into account the different skills and levels of experience of its employees. This aims to address concerns raised by some of our stakeholders that the product of the workload tools does not define the level of skill and experience required to deliver the workload. In amending the bill in this way, I intend to ensure that health boards and the agency are not only looking at how they can put in place the correct number of staff, but that those staff have the skills and experience necessary to provide the kind of safe and high quality service that I am keen to see across our NHS. Amendment 21 sets out that not only comments by patients, but also comments by individuals who have a personal interest in the patient's health care, for example, family members and carers, should be taken into account as part of the common staffing method, insofar as these comments relate to the duty to ensure appropriate staffing. This recognises the fact that, for various reasons, patients are not always able to speak for themselves, but this does not mean that their needs and wishes should not be heard and responded to. I'm not completely clear what the intention of Amendment 96 from Mr Stewart is. From my reading, it could purely be about underlining the importance of multidisciplinary services. It could be about avoiding unintended consequences of covering one staff group by a workload planning tool on other staff groups. It could be about recognising that some aspects of care could be carried out by more than one profession. I would agree with all of these, and they have been considered in the drafting of this bill, so I would welcome Mr Stewart's clarification uh, on the intention of his Amendment 96. Finally, to the amendments lodged by Mr Briggs. I see no issues with many of these amendments, although some do appear to be based, in my view, on a misunderstanding that there is some kind of hierarchy in the common staffing method, which, for clarity, is not the case. All steps in the method must be carried out, and they are all given equal weight. With that being said, it does absolutely no harm to change the order in which these things appear, and so, if Mr Briggs wishes to do so, I will not stand in the way. The amendments, which do give me some cause for concern, however, are 94, 95 and 102. In relation to Amendments 94 and 95, I'm concerned by the lack of clarity on what is meant by peer-reviewed evidence and professional and improvement organisations. What is the definition of peer-reviewed evidence and why would there necessarily be any certainty that anything reviewed by health peers should always be something that should be taken into account? In the health field, there, could, there would be numerous trials or pieces of work which some might class as evidence, upon which clinicians disagree. Is it the case that all of these should be taken into account? Similarly, what is a professional and improvement organisations? These questions are exactly the ones that were asked, will be asked by the working group set up to develop a tool, and they are best placed to determine what is relevant for that tool. 
when his review the effectiveness of the tools and the common staffing method, as is set out in Amendment 17, they will take into account the most up-to-date and relevant evidence and guidance, as is their professional duty. I do not feel it is appropriate for legislation to require a senior charge nurse, for example, to have to carry out a review of available evidence every time he or she runs a common staffing method. My preference would be to include something in guidance in order to allow for greater clarity and also greater flexibility. I would be happy to work with Mr Briggs to see if we could develop an amendment for Stage 3 if he feels strongly that he wants something included in primary legislation, although I don't believe that is necessary. With this in mind, I would ask Mr Briggs not to press Amendments 94 and 95. In relation to Amendment 102, this is, I believe, based on a proposal from the RCN who are keen to see excellence in care referenced in the bill in some way. If I'm correct in this assumption, this amendment is completely unnecessary as Section 12IB2B already sets out that account must be taken of, and I quote, insofar as it is relevant, any measures for monitoring and improving the quality of health care which are published as standards and outcomes under Section 10H1 by the Scottish Ministers, which excellence in care will be. I therefore cannot see what this amendment adds. If Mr Briggs feels that the current provisions do not achieve what is required, then, as with Amendments 94 and 95, I would be happy to work with him to develop an amendment for Stage 3, which does achieve this. As it stands, I would be very hesitant to support this am amendment, and I ask the member not to move it. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I now call on David Stewart to speak to Amendment 96 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to everyone. I speak to and move Amendment 96 in my name. As with many other amendments in this group, my amendment seeks to add to the list of considerations that must be taken account of when determining staffing levels. Uh, at Stage 1, the Committee heard evidence from a number of stakeholders about concerns that the Bill could have the unintended consequence of drawing resources in the supply of professions covered by the existing tools at the expense of other healthcare professions not yet covered by the tool. Obviously, this would not be of the benefit to delivery of quality services or improving outcomes for patients and service users, uh, which is why Amendment 96 requires account to be taken of the potential impact of other staff and professions in determining appropriate staffing levels. Other amendments brought by the Cabinet Secretary and Alec Cole Hamilton, not directly in this group, seek to embed a multidisciplinary approach to the development and review of tools. This is very welcome. However, I do also submit that, that Amendment 96 is needed in addition to these amendments referencing multidisciplinary working approaches to ensure that all professions are considered from day one of implementation of this bill and not just when the tools come up for review. Amendment 96 does not detract from the multidisciplinary amendments, rather it makes explicit their ultimate aim and is complementary to them. And hopefully these comments, convener, cover the questions that the Cabinet Secretary said in her opening remarks. Thank you very much. If there are no other members, uh, uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. I just want to clarify um, that if we're going to pursue common staffing methods that many of the tools haven't been created yet. And care homes don't have nurses working in care homes. About a third of our care homes have nursing staff, but many care homes don't have nurses working. And these are social care that's been provided. These are people's homes. So there's not nursing assessment requirements unless people are unwell for whatever reason. But I'm, I'm just really interested in how the, moving these amendments may actually restrict or allow the bill to, you know, putting on the face of the bill um, the requirement to manage common staff and methods in a restrictive way when tools haven't been developed yet for a multidisciplinary team approach. So specifically in care homes is my concern because many nurses are, aren't working in care homes. Thank you very much. Uh, can I call on Miles Briggs to wind up and to press or withdraw? 
Um, thank you, convener. Um, in terms of my amendments, both 94 and 95, um, it was looking to set out as part of the common staffing method that health boards or agency um, take into account not only measures for monitoring and improving the quality of health care, um, but also standards and outcomes. And under section 10H1 by Scottish ministers, um, that we look towards actually peer-led uh, evidence as well as part of that. Um, I've listened to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say today and I'd be happy to in terms of these uh, three amendments look towards stage three and how we can um, hopefully come to um, a cross-party agreement on this so I'm happy not to um, move those three amendments. Amendment 94 Miles Briggs wishes to withdraw is that agreed? Yep. Thank you very much. Amendment 95 Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. The amendment that amendment is therefore not moved. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. And can I call Amendment 19 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 94, Cabinet Secretary to move Moved. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet yes. Secretary. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 96 in the name of David Stewart, already debated with Amendment 94. David Stewart to move or not move? Uh, move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Well, that amendment is agreed. Thank you very much. Call Amendment 97 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 94. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 98 in the, that amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 98 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 94. Um, Miles Briggs to move or moved. not move? Uh, the question is that Amendment 98 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 21 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 94. Moved. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Call Amendment... That amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 99 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 94. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 100 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 94. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Call Amendment 101 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 94. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 22 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 18. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 102 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with 94. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. That, that amendment is not moved. Members are content. Thank you very much. Amendment 102 is not moved. We therefore move on to the next grouping, which is common staffing method, types of health care and employees covered. Can I call... Amendment 23 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, uh, grouped with amendments as shown in the grouping. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 23. Thank you, Convener. Uh, these are minor technical amendments to the health care settings covered by the duty on health boards and the agency to use the common staffing method. The purpose of amendments 23 and 25 to 29 is to clarify that where multiple types of employees or locations are covered by a healthcare setting in the table in 12 IC1, the requirement to follow the common staffing method applies where one or more of the employee types or locations are present and not just where all those listed are present. The effect of this amendment will be to ensure that, for example, for neonatal provision, which can be delivered by registered nurses, registered midwives, or a combination of the two, that the duty to use a common staffing method comes into effect when some of the employee types are present in a particular ward, not just when those, all those listed are present. Amendments 24 and 31 bring the definition of adult inpatient and small wards provision in line with the nursing and midwifery workload and workforce planning programme guidance for the use of these specific staffing level tools. Amendment 30 removes the perioperative provision entry from 12 IC. A review of the perioperative staffing level tool, which would be used as part of the common staffing method in perioperative healthcare settings, has identified issues which are currently being investigated. 
Because of this, the tool is currently unavailable for use by health boards, and as such, they would be unable to comply with the duty to use this common staffing method in perioperative settings. Amendments 34 and 35 clarify that medical students and student nurses and midwives are not included within the staffing establishment for the purposes of the common staffing method. This exclusion can be extended to other types of student in the future if necessary, as more staffing groups, such as allied health professionals, are brought within the common staffing method. I spoke last week about the importance of taking a multidisciplinary approach and in doing so recognise the important role allied health professionals play in achieving outcomes for service users. This is a point those professionals highlighted during stage one evidence sessions and which was noted by the committee. Amendment 36 arises from productive engagement with the Allied Health Professionals Federation. It clarifies that allied health professionals are an example of the type of employee that can be covered by the common staffing method. This means that when new tools are developed in the future which cover allied health professionals, the duty to use the common staffing method can be extended to cover them. Amendment 46 expands the definition of employee in section 12 IG to include those employed by a local authority under the lead agency model of integration. This means that those local authority employees will be captured under the common staffing method, which is necessary to ensure its correct operation in lead agency settings. Amendments 32, 33 and 45 are minor technical corrections to ensure that the legislation operates as intended. Throughout the bill, individual is used to describe a natural person and person to describe a legal person. However, Section 12 IC2, which sets out the types of healthcare to which the duty to use a common staffing method applies, and the definition of appropriate clinical advice in 12 IG, use the term person to describe a natural person. Amendments 32, 33 and 45 therefore change these references from person to individual to provide clarity that they refer to a natural person and to provide consistency throughout the bill. I move Amendment 23. Thank you very much. Uh, there would appear to be no other members who wish to contribute. Cabinet Secretary, is there anything you wish to say in winding up on this group of amendments? No, thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, amendments 24 to 36 inclusive are all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and are, have all been... Uh, debated. Can I invite the Minister to move amendments to 20, 24 to 36 on block? Move on block. Thank you very much. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 24 to 36 inclusive? If not, the question is that amendments 24 to 36 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. We move on to the uh, next uh, grouping, which is uh, regarding common staffing method training and consultation of staff, uh, and can I call first Amendment 103 in the name of Miles Briggs, which is grouped with Amendments 6, 104, 105 and 106. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener. Um, with regards to these amendments, um, I'm looking to put a duty on NHS boards not only to support, um, that's it, that the boards will support, not just encourage staff to share their views on the NHS Board's compliance with the le legislation going forward. As drafted, NHS Boards are only required to encourage employees to give views on, on their staffing arrangements. The requirement covers only those areas which use the common staffing method. Employees of NHS Boards will have valuable experience of staffing issues as well as views on whether the care they are able to provide is safe and of high quality. The duty on NHS Boards should therefore be strengthened so that they must actively seek the views of their employees and support them to make their views known. This could, for example, mean NHS boards ensuring that there are reasonable systems in place to collect the views of employees. A strengthened duty of engaging employees would mean that those working in areas covered by the common staffing method would have a significant opportunity to comment on and potentially shape NHS board processes for discharging the duties on them under this legislation. The operation of this legislation in practice could be further strengthened if the provisions for staff engagement at 121 DA and B and the provisions for reporting back to staff in 121 DE 
were not solely focused on the use of the common staffing method, but also took into consideration the guiding principles for staffing and the duty to ensure appropriate staffing. If amendments were accepted in the, in the need for the NHS boards to establish protocols to identify, monitoring and assess risks, supporting staff to give their views on the protocol should also then be included. My amendment 104 looks to ensure that nurses of appropriate seniority uh, receive training in the common staffing method. The bill continues uh, provision for NHS employees to be trained in using common staff the common staffing method, as well as having adequate time to use it. Education in how the use of the common staffing method and having the time to use it are hugely important, I believe, to the outcomes of this bill. It should therefore be made explicit that NHS boards will make training on the common staffing method available to nurses of appropriate seniority across all settings. Thank you very much. Can I welcome Mike Rumbles and invite him to speak to Amendment 6 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton and other amendments in this group. Thank you very much, Convener, and it's a pleasure to be here. As I say, unfortunately, Alex can't be with us. As a member of the Health Committee, I think he's visiting hospital at the moment. Um, so he's asked me to appear and uh, move his amendment for him, which, which I now do, but I'd like to just comment on it on his behalf. This amendment um, simply adds to the bill. It doesn't take anything away from it. It just, in, in his view, improves the bill. Um, so if we take into account and, and use any such views it received to identify best practice and areas for improvement in relation to such staffing arrangements, this is supported by the Royal College of Nursing, uh, and I think it would add greatly to the intention behind this section of the bill. Thank you very much. Can I... I uh, invite the Cabinet Secretary to uh, respond to these amendments. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Convener, I have no concerns with Amendment 103, and I am happy to accept Amendment, amendment 6, which I think is a helpful addition to the duty on boards in Section 12 ID. I would maintain that Amendment 104 is unnecessary, as Section 12 uh, I, IDC, as drafted, already requires all those staff who use the common staffing method to be trained. I appreciate what Amendment 105 and 106 seek to do in connection with the real-time staffing assessment procedures, but in technical terms, they are placed in the wrong part of the bill. The real-time staffing assessment procedures apply to all em employees in a health board. However, these amendments will only apply to employees covered by the common staffing method because Section 12 ID, where these amendments are inserted, only applies to employees engaged in the common staffing method, not to all employees of a health board. And I would assume that Mr Briggs' intention is to cover all employees. In addition, the opening words of Section 12 ID explicitly make compliance with the duty to use the common staffing method in Section 12 IB dependent on fulfilling the duties listed in 12 ID. Given the differing coverage of the sections, it does not make sense to make compliance in law by health boards with Section 12 IB dependent on new procedures relating to the real-time staffing assessment procedures, which are not linked to the common staffing method. The correct link for any requirements relating to those new assessment and escalating, es escalation procedures is with those new sections 12 IAA and 12 IAB, which the committee agreed to last week. This is precisely because of their wider application to all of the board's employees. I would therefore ask Mr Briggs not to press those amendments at 105 and 106 and instead bring forward alternative amendments at stage three, uh, amending the, the technically correct section of the bill, and I would be happy to work with him on that. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call on... Miles Briggs uh, to wind up and press on withdrawal. One um, three. Thank you, Convener, and I welcome um, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, agreement to support my amendments. I think uh, as we head to stage three, there's clearly going to be a lot of housekeeping to clean up this bill, so I'm happy not to um, press 105 and 106 at this stage. Sorry, but yes. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. It was another point of clarification. Uh, I think the Minister actually has picked up on what I was intending to say but I'll, I'll, I'll go again anyway when you were given your you know your, your quotations at the beginning you constantly mentioned nursing staff and that was where I was a bit concerned uh, and I think the minister has clarified it in regarding you know staffing levels um, 
I'm a wee bit concerned that it is leaned more towards nursing staff than anyone else. And would you consider withdrawing these amendments to have a chat with the committee or even the minister as per se uh, going forward to stage three? Because I do have some concerns in regards to how prescriptive it is. Sure. I hope I'm, I'm helpful in that yeah, respect. Yeah, I think in terms of where, you know, we're all agreed the multidisciplinary nature of the bill and actually in terms of health and social care integration, two very different um, sectors who we're trying to make legislation uh, work for. Um, my understanding is the Cabinet Secretary is content with um, my amendments 103 and 104 um, going forward, but I'm happy to, to not move 105 and 106 under the understanding we will um, I'll bring forward um, an, uh, an amendment at stage three, which we can hopefully all agree on. Thank you very much for that, Miles Briggs. Thank you. Miles Briggs is pressing Amendment 103. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendment 6 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 103. Mike Rumbles to move or not move? Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 104 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with 103. Miles Briggs to move or moved. not moved. The question is that Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are, that amendment is agreed. Call Amendment 105 in the name of Miles Briggs to, Miles Briggs to move or not move. Uh, not moved. Not moved. Amendment 105, 105 is not moved. Call Amendment 106 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 103. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Amendment 106 is not moved. Call Amendment 107 in the name of David Stewart. Already debate with Amendment 17. David Stewart to move or not move? Uh, thank you, Convener. Not moved. I've had a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary and I'm happy that she's taken on board the spirit of the amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I amendment 107 is therefore not moved. Call Amendment 123 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 17. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Sorry, Convener. 1, 2. Amendment 123, already yep. debated with Amendment 17. That was debated last week. Sorry. It's a million pieces of paper here. Um, moved. Amendment 123 is moved. The question is that Amendment 123 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. Um, we will therefore move to a division uh, on Amendment 123. Can I see the, all those in favour? Sorry, I'm jumping sheets of paper here. That's quite all right. Uh, therefore, the Amendment 123 is not moved by Miles Briggs. Is the committee agreed that that should not be moved? Thank you very much. That is agreed. Uh, we therefore moved on to the next grouping. Can I remind members uh, in debates on groupings uh, before I call, if members wish to contribute to the general debate, other than when moving an amendment, they should indicate before I call the Cabinet Secretary, uh, and I can therefore take their contribution separately before uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Of course, it's always open to members to intervene on on others and indeed on the Minister, but uh, if those if members wish to uh, make their own comments, then I would encourage them to do that. So this is the grouping reporting on staffing by health boards and the Scottish Ministers. I call Amendment 37 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 37 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 37 and 38 will strengthen the duty on health boards to report on how they have carried out their new duties under the Bill. This includes reporting on Section 2, which Monica Lennon's Amendment 85 passed last week, also inserted a reporting duty on. Boards will have to provide a report detail detailing <coughs> excuse me, how they have complied with the general duty to ensure appropriate staffing, the common staffing method, real-time assessment of staffing, escalation of staffing concerns, and with the duties on training and consultation of staff. Boards will have to submit these reports to ministers and publish them within one month of the end of the financial year. Amendment 40 will create an additional duty on ministers to inform Parliament about how these reports provided by health boards have been taken into account or will be taken into account when setting national staffing policy for NHS services. 
I know the committee heard evidence from stakeholders who wish to see a firmer link to workforce planning. I believe that this approach recognises that this bill is not about strategic national level workforce planning, but that the information generated by the implementation of both the duty to ensure appropriate staffing and the common staffing method within health boards is one of the factors that will be considered in such national planning. By setting out a clear reporting process, my intention is that this would create a transparency around the decisions that are taken by boards, allow scrutiny of how this is reflected in their workforce projections. Similarly, creating transparency around the information that has been provided to ministers allows scrutiny of how this information is then reflected by the Scottish Government in national workforce planning. I do not think that there is anything covered by Monica Lennon's amendments that is not already addressed by my amendments. Uh, Ms Lennon's Amendment 109 sets out a similar reporting duty on Scottish ministers. However, it does not cover the new real-time staffing and risk escalation duties that Amendment 17 places on health boards, and it does not contain the link to how the information is used to wider workforce planning. I ask the committee, therefore, to resist this amendment. I see merit in the intention behind Amendment 108, requiring health boards and the agency to report on risks and challenges. It is something I had intended guidance would set out that boards must include in their reports, so I would be happy to make it explicit as part of 12IF at Stage 3. I would therefore ask Ms Lennon not to move Amendments 108 or 109, and I move Amendment 37. Thank, Thank you very much. Can I invite Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 108 and to speak to other amendments in this group? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everyone. Similar to amendments to Section 2 and 3 of the Bill in an earlier group, these amendments aim to improve scrutiny of Health Board's compliance with the Bill. Amendment 108 does this by requiring Health Boards to specify in the information they provide to Scottish Ministers any particular risk or challenge they have faced in their compliance with their duties, namely their duty to provide appropriate staff, taking into account the guiding principles, their duty to follow any common staffing methods and their duty to provide appropriate and adequate training to staff. The purpose of including reporting on risk is to allow opportunity for the identification of any systemic or systematic issues that might hinder staffing levels, both at a health board level and a national level. My Amendment 109 requires Scottish Ministers to gather the information they receive from health boards and respond to it publicly. The amendment also uh, requires this public report from Ministers to address the risks faced by, by health boards with regards to their staffing duties. The aim of Amendment 109 is to encourage scrutiny of the decisions taken by Scottish Government with regards to national workforce planning and the staffing of our health service. I note that amendments moved by Alison Johnson last week also sought to establish the link between this bill and national workforce planning. I was supportive of those amendments and believe that Amendments 108 and 109 strengthen this connection further by ensuring that Scottish Ministers are kept accountable for mitigating risks faced by health boards in any area of national policy, be it supplier trained professionals, as Alison Johnson's amendments required, or pay levels, terms and conditions, accessibility of workplaces, for example, in, in, in rural areas. I do um, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments and recognise that Amendment 40 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary also seeks to provide a connection with National Government workforce planning, which is welcome. However, I do believe that the specific reference to risk in Amendment 109 is stronger, and I would recommend that to the committee. Thank you very much. If there are no other members who wish to contribute to this debate, invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, I would simply say, in relation to uh, my Amendment 40 or Ms Lennon's Amendment 109, let me repeat, uh, Amendment 109 from Ms, Ms Lennon does not cover the new real-time staffing and risk escalation duties that Amendment 17 places on health boards and does not contain the link to how the information is used for wider workforce planning. That, I believe, makes it a weaker amendment, and I would ask the committee to support my Amendment 40. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that Amendment 37, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
Thank you very much. Call Amendment 38 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Cab uh, Amendment uh, 37. Move. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That amendment is agreed. Can I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated uh, with Amendment 17 last week? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that agreement, uh, Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can call Amendment 40 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 37. Move. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And I call Amendment 108 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 37. Monica Lennon, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. Can I therefore uh, see, first of all, votes in favour? of Amendment 108 in the name of Monica Lennon. And can I see votes against? The result of that vote was four votes in favour and four votes against. I will therefore use my casting vote in favour of the amendment. Can I call Amendment 109 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 37. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not all agreed. Therefore, again, there will be a division. Can I see all those in favour of Amendment 109? And all those against? That division again is four in favour and four against. I will therefore uh, use my casting vote in favour of Amendment 109. Amendment 109 is therefore agreed. Can I call Amendment 41 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 17? Cabinet Secretary. To move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, Amendment 41 is agreed. We move to the next grouping, Ministerial Guidance on Staffing by Health Boards. Can I call Amendment 42 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, which is uh, grouped with Amendments 43, 44 and 47. Cabinet Secretary to move. Thank you, Convener. Uh, amendments 42, 43, 44 and 47 relate to the guidance that Ministers can produce under Section 12IF of the Bill covering the new staffing duties on Health Boards and the Common Services Agency. Section 12IF of the Bill sets out that health boards and the agency must have regard to any guidance issued by ministers when carrying out their duties under Sections 12IA to 12IE. Section 12IF3 lists those with whom ministers must consult before issuing this guidance. Amendments 42, 43, 44 make changes to this list, while Amendment 47 is consequential on Amendment 42. Amendment 42 clarifies that ministers must consult with every relevant special health board, whilst Amendment 47 sets out that relevant special health board means those to whom these duties apply as a result of Section 5. This means that ministers will not be required to consult with non-clinical special health boards as they are not covered by the Bill. It is important that trade unions and professional bodies representing staff working in all the bodies to whom duties in this bill apply, are able to offer their views on the guidance. Amendments, Amendment 43 means that as well as health boards and the Common Services Agency, ministers must consult with representatives of employees working in relevant special health boards, integration authorities to whom healthcare functions are delegated through the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014 and Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Amendment 44 adds professional regulatory bodies uh, for employees of health boards, the Common Services Agency, relevant special health boards, integration authorities to whom healthcare functions are delegated through the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014 and his to the list of those with whom Scottish ministers must consult before issuing this guidance. This will cover the relevant statutory regulators, such as the General Medical Council, the Nursing and Midwifery Council and the Health and Care Professions Council and ensure they are consulted on guidance which may impact on the professional groups that they regulate. 
I move Amendment 42. Thank you very much. If there are no other members who wish to contribute on this group, Cabinet Secretary, is there anything further you wish to add? No, thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 42 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now call Amendments 43, 44, 45, 46 and 47, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 43 to 47 on block. Move on block. Thank you very much. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 43 to 47? No. If not, the question is that Amendments 43 to 47 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. The question is that Section 4 of the Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Move on now to Section 5 and the next grouping uh, on the Bill and call Amendments 48 to 65. Uh, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 48 to 65 on block? Move on block. Does any member object to a single press question being put on Amendments 48 to 65? If no member objects, the question is that Amendments 48 to 65 are, are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, the question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. And then to the next grouping, and this is on the role of healthcare improvement Scotland in relation to staffing. I call Amendment 66 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 66A. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 66. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> I committed at stage, in the Stage 1 debate to lodge an amendment to make the role of healthcare improvement Scotland clear. Amendment 66 extends his role to existing quality insurance, insurance and improvement role by inserting new sections into the National Health Service Scotland Act 1978, setting out that his will be responsible for monitoring the discharge by every health board, relevant special health board, meaning a special health board that provides clinical health care services to patients and the common services agency of their duties under all parts of the bill. This amendment has the full support of his and has been drafted in consultation with that body. New section 12IH places the duty on his to monitor the compliance of boards and the agency with the staffing duties introduced by the bill, including the new real-time assessment and risk escalation duties under amendment 17. New section 12IJ places a duty on his to monitor the effectiveness of the common staffing method and the way in which boards and the agency are using it. His must additionally, as and when they consider appropriate, carry out discrete reviews of the CSM with a view to publishing and submitting to ministers a report recommending changes to it if required. Ministers may then, by the regulations already provided for under Section 12IB4 of the Bill, amend the common staffing method. His must have regard to the guiding principles in carrying out a review and they must consult with a range of stakeholders as listed in subsection 3 of 12IJ in doing so. Ministers also have the power to direct his to carry out such a review of the uh, common staffing method. Further to this, section 12IK sets out that his may also develop and recommend to ministers new or revised staffing level tools and professional judgment tools for use as part of the CSM in relation to any kind of healthcare provision. Ministers may then, by regulations already provided for under section 12 IB3 of the bill, prescribe this, the use of said tools as part of the common staffing method. In developing any new or revised tools, his must collaborate with those bodies mentioned previously and must again have regard to the guiding principles. Similarly, ministers may direct his to develop a new or revised staffing tool or professional judgment tool. In recognition of the view of stakeholders, and in particular the Allied Health Professions Federation, there is a need to look at the development of multi multidisciplinary tools going forward. Section 12 IL places a duty on his when developing a new or revised staffing level or professional judgment tool to consider whether it should apply to more than one professional discipline. <coughs> It also gives his a power to recommend to ministers that an, exi an existing tool should be multidisciplinary. 
His will be under a duty to monitor the effectiveness of any staffing level tool or professional judgment tool which has been prescribed by ministers under section 12IB3. This would include any new or revised tool. Sections 12IN and 12IM aim to ensure that his are given access to the support and crucially to the data which is necessary to carry out their new functions under the bill. Section 12IM requires health boards, relevant special health boards and the agency to give his such assistance as it requires in performance, performing its functions under sections 12IH to 12IL. Section 12IN gives his a power in pursuance of its functions under sections 12IH to 12IL to serve a notice on a health board, relevant special health board or the agency requiring it to provide his with information about any matter specified in the notice by a specified date. Ministers will also have a power under section 12IO to issue statutory guidance to his and to the boards about these new provisions. Finally, but importantly, the existing powers of his to inspect NHS services are extended to include the enforcement of these new functions by amendment section 10i of the, 20, of the 1978 Act. His are fully aware of this amendment and are happy with the provisions set out in it. In relation to amendment 66a, I would note that this amendment is, in my view, unnecessary, as ministers can already direct his to carry out a review of the common staffing method under section 12IJ4, or to develop a new or revised level tool or professional judgment tool under section 12IK5. This could include a direction that his look at particular matters, including staff absences and bed occupancy levels. However, I do not feel that this amendment does any particular harm, and I will therefore not stand in Mr Briggs' way if he wishes to press it. I move Amendment 66. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I call Miles Briggs to move Amendment 66A and speak to 66. Thank you, and Convener. And from Stage 1, welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has brought uh, this forward. I think we're both actually trying to achieve the same thing in our amendments here. I specifically was looking to allow Ministers to prescribe um, what could be included, because I think our original discussions around a multidisciplinary, uh, disciplinary approach is very di different to multidisciplinary tools. And given the different workforces, how we take that forward, I think is important. Um, I'm happy to press my amendment and hope that um, at stage three we'll finally get uh, something in the bill which is workable. Thank you very much. If there are no other members who wish to speak, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to wind up on Amendment 66? I have nothing further to add. And Miles Briggs to wind up on 66A and press or withdraw. Um, nothing further to add and press. Thank you very much. In that case, the question is that Amendment 66A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 66. Uh, press. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. I now call Amendment 110 in the name of David Stewart, already debated with Amendment 84. David Stewart, to move or not move? Uh, not moving following a helpful discussion with the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. I now call, the, therefore, the quest, Amendment 110 is not moved with the uh, agreement of the committee. Thank you very much. And then we move on to Section 6 and the next... Uh, grouping which is in relation to the duty of uh, care service providers to ensure appropriate staffing. I will call Amendment 7 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton which was grouped with Amendments 111, 112 and 67 and can I call Mike Rumbles to move Amendment 7 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much convener. Um, as I say these um, I'm here on behalf of Alex Cole Hamilton's amendments but I also like obviously to speak to the cabinet secretaries Amendment 67 as well. All of these amendments are intended to improve the bill, and I think uh, whichever way we go, it will be an improvement. Um, if I could say that actually, I think Alex's, Alex called Hamilton's amendment, are more comprehensive, if I can put it that way, and more effective than the Minister's amendment in this case. And the reasons are as follows, because we're looking at any person who provides a care service must ensure that at all times suitably qualified and competent individuals are working in the care service in such numbers 
as are appropriate for the health, well-being and safety of service users. And Alex Cross Hamilton's amendment says, and staff. I think that's really important. It's about the health, well-being and safety of service users and staff. So in, this amendment is particularly uh, um, supported by the Royal College of Nursing as well. And taken together with the other two amendments, 111 and 112, in the next subsection, the provision of safe and high quality care and services. Taken these three amendments together, they are far more comprehensive than looking at the Minister's choice in 67 when she says adding a subsection C insofar as affects either of those matters in A or B, the well-being of staff. Whereas Alex Cole Hamilton's amendments cover um, health, well-being and safety. So I think it's I don't need to add any more than that to say that I, I think they are far more comprehensive. They build on the importance of this section, and I think it, I would hope for unanimous support for it. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 67 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Convener, I appreciate the valid aim of Amendment 7 to ensure staff wellbeing is considered in ensuring adequate numbers of staff. Uh, however, as I said last week in relation to Amendment 3, we must be mindful that employment and health and safety law are reserved matters and not for this Parliament. I also stated for Amendment 3, uh, but will restate again for clarity, that an almost identical provision to this proposed amendment already exists in health and safety legislation, and we would not want to replicate in the Bill any duty that already exists in primary legislation. With this legislation, we seek to ensure safe, high-quality services. Success will create a virtuous circle of better outcomes for patients, together with improved well-being for the staff. For, uh, evidence does demonstrate that one can affect the other. We have already, uh, already have ensuring the well-being of staff as a guiding principle, and uh, throughout the Bill, for the sake of clarity, we uh, express concern and uh, institute provisions uh, to ensure he their health and safety. Uh, I'm not averse to the aims of Amendment 7. Uh, however, I will move Amendment 67 as a replacement, which I will, uh, answer the, I believe, answer the request of the committee in the Stage 1 report to include staff wellbeing in the duty on care service providers to ensure appropriate staffing. As with Amendment 15 in the health context, which was uh, unfortunately not passed last week, Amendment 67 will keep the primary focus of the legislation on the welfare of service users, while considering staff well-being in terms of how it impacts on the service itself. In relation to Amendments uh, 111 and 112, Section 6 of the Bill provides that any person who provides a care service must ensure that at all times suitably qualified and competent individuals are working in their service in such numbers as are appropriate for the health, well-being and safety of their service users and the provision of high-quality care. Amendment 111 would state that any, any person who provides a care service must ensure that such numbers must be working as are appropriate for the provision of safe and high-quality care. I have no concerns, therefore, with Amendment 111, given the clear aims of the Bill to secure safe and high-quality care. Amendment 112 would state that such numbers must be working as are appropriate for the provision of high-quality care and services. Whilst this does duplicate which is a, what, what is already provided, as the care is the service, I will not stand in the member's way if they wish to accept this amendment. I therefore ask the committee to support Amendment 67, but not to support Amendment 7. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I see Brian Whittle and George Adam. Thank you, Kimmy. Just, just for clarity, um, Cabinet Secretary here, I, I think what you, you've highlighted the fact that uh, the primary, uh, the primary concern here is to look after the, 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 the concerns of the patients here at all, at all times uh, and their well-being. But I think also what my concern about this is, is uh, we should, in doing so, we should also consistently look after the health of our healthcare professionals. And I'm, I'm assuming, Cabinet Secretary, that that's something that you would agree with. And I'm not sure, um, if, if uh, especially in Round 67, if that's the case here, um, because I think one. Uh, goes in hand with the other, and looking after the health of our healthcare professionals is key to looking after the health of patients. 
Which I'm, I'm he wished to intervene on Mr Whittle if you choose. Well, I, I'm not going to disagree with Mr Whittle, and I think uh, I've already said I'm not going to stand in the way of amendments 111 and 112. I'm also making the point that our uh, elsewhere in the bill we have clear provisions that uh, show our commitment to the health, well-being and safety of staff. Uh, my uh, primary point is that the focus of this legislation is on the quality uh, of the provision to those who receive it. And there is uh, multiple evidence and indeed that virtuous circle that I spoke about that in order to do that, you have to ensure the health, well-being and safety of staff. So I kind of think we might be dancing on the head of a pin here. I, I don't have a problem with 111 and 112. Uh, my concern is around Amendment 7 which I believe replicates uh, legislation which is not necessarily in our power to do so. Mr Whittle, have you completed? I'm fine, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, firstly, can I just talk about the positive side? I think the 111 and 112 I, I, I can support, and obviously 67, but with 7, I have an issue, and it's similar to the issue I brought up last week and the Cabinet Secretary's brought up as well. Although we welcome the, what it tries to do, uh, there is this uh, problem with the potential competency of the actual amendment in itself, in so much that it does start moving on to reserved issues with uh, health and safety. So I mentioned this last week, and I mentioned it again because I do have some concerns with that. So possibly that's something we need to be very mindful of when we take this forward. OK, thank you very much. If there are no other members, I will call my grumbles to wind up and to press a withdrawal. Thank you very much, Convener. I'm, I'm surprised to find such a red herring um, suddenly appear in this debate. Um, it is a red herring, the health and safety legislation. I think the Minister, sorry, the Cabinet Secretary, is, it might not be so well advised on, on this issue because it does not trespass on health and safety law. Uh, if it did then you couldn't have what's in the bill already, which is the well-being and safety of service users. You can't draw the distinction to say that the health uh, and safety of service users isn't to do with health and safety, and then say, because it's the staff, it is health and safety. It isn't. So this, this is a... Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Rumbles for taking the intervention. I think perhaps you're mixing it up slightly. Obviously, it's the health and well-being, but we're talking about legislation, which is reserved. And I think that's where the point is. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I think the member misunderstands the point I'm making. The point I'm making is the minister, the cabinet secretary, has brought forward this legislation. Mm -hmm. If it contravened health and safety legislation for service users, the safety of service users, it couldn't be in here. I think you're... So, so the, po the point I'm making, uh, and I haven't given away already on this point, we are including staff, the people who work in the organisation as well as the people who use the organisation. Health and safety legislation applies to everybody who uses a facility, whether they are members of staff or not. And the detail of health and safety law is in health and safety legislation. This does not contravene health and safety legislation. If it was, if it did, this would be incompetent in the bill. So I'd like to put to rest that red herring. Order, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike Rumbles, are you pressing Amendment 7? I, I am indeed pressing, all, uh, pressing the amendment because it, it, it certainly improves the bill dramatically. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not all agreed. There will therefore be a division. Can I see those in favour of Amendment 7? Can I see those against? That division is 4-4, uh, four, four, and I will use my casting vote in favour of that amendment. Amendment 7 is therefore agreed. And I call Amendment 111 in the name of Alex Hamil Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move. Moved. Amendment 111, uh, the question is that Amendment 111 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 112 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 7. Mike Rumbles to move or not move. The question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And I call Amendment, that amendment is agreed. Can I call Amendment 67 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 7? Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you very much. 
The question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. The, the, amendment 67 is therefore agreed. The question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Move on to the next grouping of amendments in relation to care services risk management procedure. Call amendment 113 in the name of David Stewart in a group on its own. David Stewart to move and speak to amendment 113. Thank you, convener. Uh, this amendment in my name seeks to ensure that care sector providers have in place appropriate processes for assessment and managing risk associated with staffing levels, as my previous amendment sought to do for health services. Having spoken to stakeholders in the sector, including Scottish Care, I have submitted a slightly pared down amendment compared to my related amendment in part two. Uh, risk management escalation procedures are there partly to protect staff and employees who have to find solutions to staffing challenges in the real time by giving them clear guidance and steps they can take. Uh, can I just finish this and I'll, and I'll come back? Contribution once Mr Stewart has yeah. completed his, or, or to take an intervention. However, it was suggested that prescribing the steps that must be taken by employees could have the unintended consequences of placing significant responsibilities and bureaucratic burden on already stretched and hard-working employees. That's why Amendment 113 places responsibility on providers to set out risk management procedures but allows flexibility for local contexts. Uh, risk management procedures must be policy as standard, and this amendment seeks to standardise this as much as possible with regard to staffing the sector. And I give way to Sandra White. Uh, I, I thank the, the member very much. Uh, I've also consulted various uh, you know, organisations and uh, had various feedback as well. And COSLA, uh, I presume everyone had got that from COSLA as well, and also my own area in Glasgow, social work department there as well. And, and they say it's... Uh, puts an added burden onto care services, particularly ones who are smaller care services. Uh, it's another layer of bureaucracy, which basically in the situation as it is at the moment, going through consultation in care services, they feel that this coming in at this moment may jeopardise any agreement that's made with care services. Uh, and they also say that uh, it seems to not really give any... Um, elaboration of how good care service could be if this amendment is put forward. Uh, basically, they think it's uh, an additional burden uh, in regards to legislation and scrutiny. So I would ask David Stewart to take that particular point on board, coming from COSLA and also coming for, from service users uh, within my own uh, constituency in Glasgow and coming from Glasgow City Council, Head of Social Work Department as well. Uh, I thank him for bringing it forward because it's good to be having a debate on that particular one. But I would ask if perhaps, as I did previously, uh, if you have spoken to the minister, the cab sec, that would be great. If not, perhaps uh, you know you wouldn't press the, this particular amendment. Well, uh, can I thank through your convener Sandra White for her contribution? Obviously, I respect Cosla and all the players uh, in the care sector. Obviously, I have. Uh, had discussions with a, a number of them. Uh, I do think this is an important uh, uh, amendment. Bob, I'm happy to listen to the points that the Cabinet Secretary may make on this particular amendment. Thank you very much. Are other members wishing to contribute? If not, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary please to respond to this? Uh, thank you, Convener. Convener, I am mindful that the risk escalation procedure I've proposed for health settings has been developed through very detailed work with representatives of nurses, midwives, medics and allied health professions. Given the importance of this, I would be very reluctant to re apply a similar process to care service providers without working closely with them to ensure it is proportionate and effective. I have no issues with the intention of Mr Stewart's amendment, but in terms of scope, the way in which it is drafted would cover the full range of care providers. Uh, this means that all those who fall within Section 47.1 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, including childminders. Uh, there are over 5,000 registered childminders, as an example, in Scotland who mainly work individually. Uh, as worded, uh, this amendment would require each to have an escalation pro uh, policy. I am sure that that is not Mr Stewart's intention, uh, and I'm sure too that the committee would agree that that would be uh, disproportionate. And what I would suggest, I uh, would ask Mr Stewart uh, to withdraw the amendment, to not press it, uh, so that we can work 
uh, together to bring forward a replacement at stage three, uh, which is drafted in such a way as to meet his intention, but not be so wide in its scope. Thank you very much. Can I ask David Stewart to wind up and press or withdraw? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, in light of the uh, contribution to Andrew White and the Cabinet Secretary, I'm happy to go away and, and think again about this particular amendment, particularly uh, with my colleagues at COSLA. And in light of that, I'm not pressing this amendment. Thank you very much. Amendment 113 is withdrawn with the agreement of the committee. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next grouping, Care Services Training of Staff. Uh, and again, uh, call Amendment 114 in the name of David Stewart in a group on its own. David Stewart to move and speak Thank to you, Amendment Convener. 114. Amendment 114 in my name seeks to ensure that should Scottish Ministers mandate the use of staffing tool by care services, that they take responsibility for adequately resourcing the training required. Social care providers' margins are tight and full-time staff is limited, so it's important that resources are there to reimburse staff for training uh, that they are obliged to undergo. Similarly, care providers should not be forced to pay for additional training time out of squeezed resources. As we've seen with implementation of the living wage for social care workers and overnight carers, new policy and standards from the Scottish Government must be backed up by resources if they're going to make a difference at the ground level. The financial memorandum does make some reference to funding the training associated with implementing the use of the tools. This amendment merely makes the obligation on Scottish ministers to fund the training explicit in the bill. This will be important should costs run by more than was originally estimated in the financial memorandum. Sandra White. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, once again, I thank you, David Stewart, for, for that also. I think it clarifies some points in regards to, obviously, uh, funding as well. Uh, I have also, as I said previously, spoke to COSLA and various others as well, and I'm sure everyone has had COSLA's um, letter back to them. I mean, it basically asks COSLA and others ask that this is further considered by commissioners uh, at this moment in time, as obviously the, the commissioner authority are the ones that fund uh, you know, uh, this as well, and they would like to go through the process fully, COSLA with the commissioners and through the bill also, and I would ask that this is taken into consideration. Uh, I think they're willing to work, as, as they always do, uh, and I would ask uh, if you, the member wouldn't press this particular one, and um, perhaps uh, Cabinet Secretary may have something to say in that particular one as well. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. It's just a quick question, maybe that David will... David Stewart will be able to answer in his summing up. Is this assuming that all training is provided away from the place of service provision? Because in my experience, a lot of training is provided and delivered at the bedside, at the place of care, at the place of residence. So it's creating a very narrow approach, which doesn't really enable training to be uh, I, I guess, more widely appreciated in the diversity that it is provided. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Convener, again, I, I appreciate what Mr Stewart uh, is intending uh, to achieve with this amendment. I think that we do all agree that it is uh, entirely right that care staff are properly trained. I, I believe that is recognised in Section 7. But the, the suggested amendment, the proposed amendment, is, in my view, fundamentally flawed in that the Scottish Government does not directly fund or contract with care service providers. They are private providers who are contracted by local authorities, integration authorities and health boards. And indeed, when they are, uh, as uh, when the Scottish Government has a policy approach, as it uh, has in terms of the real living wage, those funds are provided to those who then contract with care service providers. Uh, should they not pass that on? Uh, that, of course, is something between the Scottish Government and those to whom we provide the funds, such as local authorities. But we do not have that direct contracting arrangement with care service providers. We have set out in the financial memorandum our expectation to fund the initial training for using a staffing method. But I can't see how the Scottish Government could ensure that everyday training costs for private providers and for every kind of training, not just training and the use of any new staffing methods, are resourced and allocated on a year-in, year-out basis. That would be entirely contrary to the existing funding framework and the way that funding for care service providers operates. On that basis, I would ask members not to support this amendment. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I call on David Stewart to wind up and press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, Camille. I think there is, um, this is a very important issue. I think having fully funded training is essential. And I would point out, as far as the living wage is concerned, we have seen in practice, while that is Scottish government policy, that some, um, uh, some carers are not getting the living wage. So clearly there is a problem in the system. Um, however, I think we generally all agree that, uh, the overall principle about this. I'm happy not to uh, pursue this on the basis that I can come back at stage three and perhaps have some further contributions from providers uh, and from the Scottish Government. So on that basis, I'll not press. Amendment 114 will, is withdrawn with the consent of the committee. Thank you very much. The question then is that section seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I have a number of amendments in section 8. Can I call amendments 68, 69, 70 and 71, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, all previously debated, and invite Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 68 to 71 en bloc. En bloc. Does any member object to these being put as a single question? If not, the question is that amendments 68 to 71, inclusive, are agreed. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Those amendments are therefore agreed. The question is that section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. The question is that section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. Thank you very much. We move on to section 10. The next group covers staffing methods for care services, development and review. Can I call amendment 115 in the name of Miles Briggs, group with amendments as shown in the grouping. Miles Briggs. Uh, to move Amendment 115 and speak to amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. The Amendment uh, 115 amends Section 28A1, the development of staffing methods changing the function for the Care Inspectorate from a power to develop and recommend a staffing method for care homes and other care services as specified by Scottish Ministers to an obligation to do so. It's important to note that any new tools, I believe, need to be developed um, and tested in collaboration across the sector. This is what I was looking to achieve uh, with Amendment 115. Um, with regards to the overall bill around social care, I think we need to look at stage through three, how we uh, can take forward um, the bill which will work uh, for them. Um, so I'm happy to uh, hear any comments on this amendment from across committee. Thank you very much. Can I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 72 and, other, and to speak to other amendments in the group? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wish to give members the assurances that the Government wishes to see the development of a staffing method and tool for care homes for older people, as we have stated in the policy memorandum. The Care Inspector is ready to support its development. However, I would ask members not to support Amendment 115 as if the approach outlined in this bill will only be successful with the cooperation and active participation of the sector. It needs to be collaborative and cannot be an imposed solution, which the word must suggests in this amendment. This is absolutely crucial for the success of this part of the bill, and on that basis, I would ask Mr Briggs not to press Amendment 115. Uh, members may have gained the impression that the Care Inspectorate has abandoned uh, staffing numbers in care homes. Um, the Care Inspectorate has changed its approach rather than rely on historic ratio. It is requiring providers to carry out assessments of individual dependency, aggregating this and determining on a regular and dynamic basis um, what implication this has for their staffing profile and numbers. This is an approach which anticipates what will be required as the tools develop and should be welcomed. I have uh, nothing to say on Amendment 116. Turning to my own amendments in the group, Section 10 of the Bill inserts a new Section 82A into the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010, empowering the Care Inspectorate to develop staffing methods for care services working together with the persons listed in subsection 2 of section 82A. Following conversations with relevant stakeholders, Amendment 72 adds the Social Services Council to that list, while Amendment 73 adds every health board. Amendment 74 fulfils a request of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee that all guidance in this legislation issued by Scottish Ministers is published. As you are aware, at present, there are no tools or staffing methods in use for care. For when such tools and methods are developed, Amendment 79 would give the Care Inspectorate the power to review and redevelop them. 
In doing so, uh, SCSWIS must collaborate, have regard to ministerial guidance and develop staffing tools in the same way as if developing a new staffing method. Ministers will also be able to direct the Care Inspectorate to redevelop a staffing method if necessary. In addition, Section 82BB in Amendment 79 will require the Care Inspectorate in developing, reviewing and recommending a staffing tool to consider if the tool should be multidisciplinary, making consistent provision to the new functions for Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Amendment 76 is consequential to Amendment 79 and would enable ministers to require, through regulations, the use of any redeveloped staffing method recommended by the Care Inspectorate. I'm happy to support Amendment 79A from Monica Lennon. Finally, in relation to Ms Johnson's Amendment 125, I would ask for clarification on several issues. It is not clear if the intention in, is that this section should be restricted to reporting on the supply to care service providers or to apply more widely. I, I don't believe that is clear from the amendment itself. If this is only intended to apply to care service providers, then I'm not clear uh, who uh, Ms Johnson has in mind when she refers to medical practitioners. This would generally be understood to apply only to registered doctors. However, this is presumably not who Ms Johnson has in mind in relation to care. I would also point out that care homes are private sector services and that Scottish ministers have no locus in employment or recruitment in the private sector. So I am not clear how Ms Johnson believes her amendment would work in practice. I find the lack of clarity on certain points in this amendment, which would then, if passed, become primary legislation, troubling and would therefore struggle to accept it. I'd be happy to work with Ms Johnson on an amendment for stage three, if she would be willing, and I therefore ask her not to move uh, this amendment. Uh, in conclusion, uh, convener, I ask the members to support the, uh, the committee to support amendments in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call on Monica Lennon to speak to Amendment 79A and other amendments in the group? Thank you, Convener. Amendment 79A relates to the powers of the Care Inspectorate. It ensures that they can review not only the use of a staffing tool, but also whether providers are complying with the general duty to provide appropriate staff levels under Section 6. The purpose of the amendment is to clarify that the remit of the Care Inspectorate is to consider staffing levels um, sorry, that the remit of the Care Inspectorate to consider staffing levels is not limited by the existence or otherwise of a staffing tool. Current inspections by the Care Inspectorate consider staffing levels already as policy. This amendment shouldn't therefore create any additional burdens or obligations on providers or in the wider social care sector. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's support for Amendment 79A. Thank you very much. And can I welcome Alison Johnson and invite her to speak to Amendment 125 and other amendments in this group. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, amendment 125 is similar to Amendment 90 um, for health services, which was agreed by this committee last week in Part 2 of the Bill. Um, this amendment, too, recognises that workforce and workload are inextricably linked, and it aims to ensure that the government has considered all the relevant information available to them when they commission training places for those for whom they can commission training places who work in this sector too. Um, we know that care homes are now caring for people with far greater and more complex illnesses, including palliative and end of life needs, um, and this means increased you know challenges around caring for people with dementia, frailty, mobility problems, and that you know there's a, a real need for sort of specialist input around nutrition and hydration. And um, I think it's significant that 65% of care home residents are now assessed as requiring nursing care. In 2007, only 10% of residents had a physical disability or a chronic illness. And this figure is now at 38%. Um, in the same period, we've seen a 44% increase in men over 95 living in care homes, and we've seen a 15% increase in women over the age of 95 living in care homes. Um, and the care home workforce data tells us that 77% of services have staff, have staff vacancies. So um, my amendment would seek to 
ensure that uh, this, the same due consideration as we're giving to making sure that we have appropriate staff in the NHS is given to this sector, which is clearly facing significant challenge. Um, I'm open to working with the Cabinet Secretary, though, to progressing a form of words for Stage 3 that would meet with everyone's approval, if that is helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I see if other members wish to contribute? Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. I am interested in seeing how this would develop, so I'm looking at Miles Briggs' amendment, and um, I'm concerned that any imposition of any tools that have been developed which are nurse-focused um, would actually not work for a multidisciplinary team approach. There are many care homes that have nursing places, but it's a residential care home that uh, is the people's homes, and as I've mentioned before. So I'm keen to, to look at collaboration and multidisciplinary team approach. Um, currently, nurses in the NHS do go to care homes to provide um, nursing assessment and care and service provision in a nursing uh, way. But I, I'm really keen to not put anything on the face of the bill that might mean it restricts any way that flexibility in working, team development, multidisciplinary team collaboration, because that's actually key to looking at how we develop care in the future. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Well, to Emma Harper, I think it's probably already been said on, under Miles Briggs Amendment 115. I think the, the big thing for me is uh, changing the may to must. I think that's too prescriptive, and I would ask Miles to, 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 to think about that particular one. Uh, obviously, I'm coming back on from COSLA and also the other experience one, and just to put on the record, David Williams, who I mentioned, is not just the Social Care in Glasgow, he's actually the Health and Social Care Scotland Chief um, Officer Group. So I just wanted to put that on record. If I could also mention, sorry to Alison Johnson in that respect, uh, I did have, you know, concerns... Uh, Previous to the previous amendment, I did I did raise that as well. But I'm pleased that Alison is looking at this. I think it is something in Amendment 125 that needs to be looked at. But I also feel that um, it's not just uh, nursing staff. You'd mentioned uh, certain numbers of people who are needing nursing care in care homes. But equally, there are people in care homes who don't necessarily need a nurse there constantly all the time. So I think we look at have to look at the fact that uh, a bit of flexibility. But I'm pleased that you what you said previously that you'd be happy to work with the Cabinet Secretary and perhaps the committee uh, going forward to stage three, because I think it is something that needs a wee bit more clarity in regards to the amendment that you're proposing. Thank you very much. George Adam. Thank you, Gabriela. I, I just want to agree with my colleagues and add some uh, extra parts that Scottish Care actually brought up during this, particularly with uh, Amendment 115. They said that they needed uh, flexibility and an appropriate set of tools, not a nursing acute tool imposed upon them. And I think it's quite interesting because they're the ones that are dealing day in, day out with, in their care homes. And they also mentioned the fact, uh, if I'm summarising some of the things that they said, was a failure to understand care homes are non-clinical environments. And it's a bit of a mistake we've had, and even in this debate here today, uh, we've had a, a bit of a misunderstanding with that as well. And they have a concern as well that it creates, it's a creation of a tick box list of clinical issues paying no regard to new outcomes and focus and effectively taking away from what we all believe is uh, having a person central values at the very core of everything that we do here. So I, I think when you look at some of the things that have been brought up by those involved in the sector, I think you can see why uh, 115 is probably a difficulty for us at this stage. But again, it could be something that could be worked on, possibly, I don't know, uh, between now and stage three. But I think uh, we have to make sure that all of this has a joint working collaborative approach, as Emma Harper said, and ensure that you know people that are working in the se sector, it's not just about the nursing staff, it's also about everyone who works in the sector. And I think that's one of the most important parts of this. Thank you very much. Bob Doris. Very briefly, Convener, in relation to Alison Johnson's amendment, which I thought she raised in a, a very reasonable manner, there is something in there about getting the correct staffing mix um, in care homes, and I was inspired to speak in relation to palliative care, which is something I'm, uh, uh, um, I've got a very particular interest in, and just in relation to the skills mix, because sometimes 
uh, non-nursery staff and care homes are worth their absolute weight in gold and different care homes have got different models of care for palliative and end-of-life care and just that slight nervousness about being prescriptive about staffing levels and what, what the various disciplines would be but I do appreciate that actually uh, we would want to capture the demands on care homes and the various skills mixes that exist in order to make sure there's suitable professionals been trained to come through into the system for uh, workforce planning going forward. So there's definitely something in Alison Johnson's amendment, maybe not in the forum it is just now, but I think it's, it's worthwhile and should be explored further. Thank you very much. If there are no other members who wish to contribute or, or respond, I'll invite Miles Briggs to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 115. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, in terms of all the remarks which have been expressed ac across uh, committee, I think it's important, um, you know, as we head towards stage three, to look towards how what we're trying to achieve. Just put on record in terms of COSLA's submission that they did not support inclusion of social care workforce in the bill. So I think it's important to maybe highlight. Um, in terms of uh, my amendment, having spoken to the Cabinet Secretary this morning, I'm happy not to press it at this stage and look towards um, stage three and bring something forward then. Thank you very much. The amendment 115 is, is not pressed, is withdrawn with the consent of the committee. Uh, can I call amendment 116 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with 115. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Again, not moved with the consent of the committee. Thank you very much. We therefore move on to the next group, which is in relation to staffing methods for care services, content and frequency of use. Uh, this is uh, the last group in the uh, proceedings on the bill, although we have a number of questions to put thereafter. Uh, but can I call Amendment 117 in the name of Miles Briggs, grouped with other amendments as shown in the groupings? Thank you, Convener. Um, Amendment 117 specifically looks to add to assist with the development of staffing methods for care services. Care Inspectorate will also uh, be developing these indicators of clinical quality for care home services um, for adults. However, there must be a commitment, I believe, to a tool being developed by the sector that it's not too restrictive and can fit with a person-centred, outcome-focused approach that social care wish as we move towards integration. Um, therefore, that's what this amendment looks to uh, entail. In terms of Amendment 122, um, I wanted to look at the development of a potential for staffing method for nursing homes. Um, as Bob Doris has outlined, in terms of workforce planning in the future for further engagement and collaboration, which will be needed to help build a co collective support to develop um, new tools in, in the future, given that there are no tools currently in existence. Any new tool would therefore look to pay special attention to the environment um, of various care homes. Thank you very much. Can I call the Cabinet Secretary to move, uh, sorry, to speak to Amendment 75 and other amendments in the group? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Convener, if I may, I'll speak to Amendments 117 and 118 first. Uh, I understand the desire for the Care Inspectorate to develop and use indicators of clinical quality for care home services for adults. However, this would require any tool developed in care to be partially or wholly focused on clinical measures. This does not fit with the person-centred, non-medicalised and outcomes-focused approach to social care that is our uh, aspiration through integration. And I wonder whether this amendment was intended to say clinical and quality rather than clinical quality. Um, and it may be that we could work further on this uh, to make that clear if uh, that was indeed Mr Briggs' attention. I have committed to the staffing method being developed by the sector uh, and I believe uh, otherwise these other amendments are too restrictive due to making assumptions about what the tool would be with this in mind, I would ask the committee not to support amendments 117 and 118. As I've alluded to, the existing common staffing method and tools for health were developed with the nursing, midwifery, and in the case of the emergency care tool, medical professions. The people representing those professions were not told what, that the method or tools they developed must take particular things into account. It was them, for them to decide on their professional judgment what was appropriate. If Amendment 119 is passed, the same opportunities will not have been afforded to the care sector 
And I think it would be difficult in those circumstances for us to argue that that sector was being treated with the equity and respect that I know we would all wish it to be treated uh, with in order to ensure that we successfully deliver integrated health and social care. Uh, this amendment would change the wording at 82A5 from may to must, thereby prejudicing uh, what has, be, has to be in any staffing method that may develop. In doing so, it would contradict the reassurances that I have given to the sector that any staffing me methods developed for care settings would be developed by the sector for the sector. Uh, and whilst I take the point uh, that in uh, the early stages, COSLA uh, did not wish social care to be included in, in this bill, uh, following uh, significant discussions and uh, uh, a willingness on their part to reconsider their view, I think it is now fair to say that COSLA, with some of these important assurances about uh, the role, uh, given their role in delivering uh, social care, um, that we respect uh, their judgment and their experience along with the care sector uh, that COSLA would now be supportive uh, in working with us on developing uh, just such a tool with the care inspectorate. Should amendment 119 be moved and passed, uh, then I would bring an amendment at stage three to ensure flexibility in these provisions in the staffing method. Uh, as I mentioned previously in relation to amendments 94 and 95, I'm concerned by the lack of clarity on what is meant by professional and improvement organisations in Amendment 120. My preference, as with Amendments 94 and 95, would be to include something in guidance in order to allow for greater clarity and greater flexibility. Um, written evidence to the Committee from Motor Neuron Disease Scotland and others highlighted the position of carers and their families and emphasised the importance of their voice. Amendment 75 clarifies that taking into account their comments on the general appropriate staffing duty is one of the elements that may be included in any staffing method developed by the Care Inspectorate under Section 82A. Amendment 121, lodged by Mr Stewart, requires that ministers ensure adequate resources are allocated to the Care Inspectorate to enable them to develop staffing methods for care services. The financial memorandum already clearly sets out the financial support for the care inspectorate. I am of the view that this is not something for primary legislation. It is something for the normal executive duties of government and for scrutiny by members from across the parliament as part of the budget process, not for scrutiny by the courts, which is what a statutory duty can lead us to. On that basis, I would ask Mr Stewart not to press Amendment 121. Amendments 77 and 78 relate to the frequency of use of any staffing methods for care services which are prescribed through regulations made under Section 82B. This covers similar grounds to Amendments 18 and 22, which I addressed earlier, on the frequency of use for the common staffing method in the NHS. Section 82B provides Scottish ministers with a power to prescribe the use of a staffing method that has been developed by the Care Inspectorate. 82B2C sets out that these regulations may specify the frequency of use of staffing level tools. It does not allow ministers to prescribe the frequency of use of a staffing method as a whole. Whilst a staffing method and tool for care settings has yet to be developed, the expectation is that a method and tool would not be run separately. This is reflected in the requirement in section 82A4 for any staffing method developed by the Care Inspectorate to include the use of staffing level tools. It is therefore the Scottish Government's intention that the staffing method and not just the tools should be used at a specified frequency. Accordingly, Amendment 78 removes section 82B2C whilst Amendment 77 sets out a replacement power for Scottish ministers to prescribe in regulations the frequency at which the staffing method as a whole, not just the tools, is to be used. As with the health provisions, as well as providing clarity that Scottish ministers can specify the frequency with which a staffing method for care services should be used and not just the tools, these amendments would also remove any possible suggestion that a tool can be used <clears throat> excuse me, separately from a staffing method or that a staffing method can be followed without using a tool. In relation to Amendment 122, 
This is, I believe, based on a proposal from the RCN, who are keen to see that the views of a senior nurse be sought if a staffing method and tool is developed for care homes for adults. As I've already said, a tool or a method has yet to be developed for this sector, and this amendment makes assumptions about the aspects of care that will be covered by a staffing method. This amendment is unlikely to be supported by the sector, in my view, as it is too restrictive, and I would ask the committee to reject Amendment 122. Uh, with that, convener, I ask members to support the amendments in my name. Thank you very much. I call David Stewart to speak to Amendment 121 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Amendment 121 in my name in the group is similar to my earlier amendment, 114, with regards to the resourcing of training for the use of new staffing tools. Amendment 121 places an obligation on the Scottish Government to fully resource and fund the development of tools for the social care sector should it be considered when they are required. In the financial memorandum for the bill, there is reference to the cost of developing the tools with 200,000 per annum over three years for contributions to the development from the sector. It is acknowledged that development of tools for the sector um, could be complicated and it is possible that the time and cost required are more than estimated. Should this be the case, organisations in the sector should be appropriate reimbursed and Amendment 121 merely makes the obligation on Scottish ministers explicit in the bill. Thank you very much. I think Sandra White indicated. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. If I could just speak to some of the amendments which are in the group. Uh, obviously, uh, Miles Biggs, uh, Amendment 117 and 118. Um, the evidence that I have been given, and obviously I've, I've looked at it and spoke to it before also, uh, says that Amendment 117 is restrict, restrictive uh, by stating that the care inspectorate must develop indicators of a clinical quality for care home for adults. Uh, I believe that uh, by focusing on clinical measures, it doesn't fit in with the person-centred approach to delivering health and social care, which throughout uh, you know, the debates and contributions, it does underpin into, you know, integration, and that's what the bill should be doing. And equally, 118 looks at that particular possibility too. People should be spoken to and collaborated working. So I feel like I couldn't support 117 and 118 in that regard. Uh, Dave Stewart obviously has explained 121 is similar to 114, which I spoke to also, and I think the Cabinet Secretary also mentioned that... Um, uh, the Scottish Government does not give monies to, to you know, care homes. Some of them are private care homes as well, and it has to go through the Commission in that respect, and it has to go through individual local authorities too. So I have uh, reservations in 121, which is similar to 114, which I know that Dave Stewart did withdraw. The most substantive one, I think, is Amendment 1. Two two, uh, basically, you know, requires nursing homes to have a staffing pool uh, uh, and seeks the views of a registered nurse. Uh, and I do certainly agree with what the cabinet secretary has said. Also, uh, this is a multidisciplinary staffing teams which are used in care homes. We heard evidence before that uh, we have uh, various, uh, you know, abilities and various, we have nurses there also who actually are perhaps older nurses who have more experience and more multidisciplinary uh, you know, nursing experience. And basically what I have been told, and I will say this about, um, it's basically saying that um, uh, this is from um, the social work departments. It says singling out one element of the multidisciplinary staffing team uh, appears to look as though it's preferential treatment and everyone should be treated the same. Uh, and in the spirit of integration, you would hope that the tools would actually be developed in a collaborative way. So I think that's something we really need to look at because we are looking at multidisciplinary, we are looking at integration, and we need to look at a collective support of tools which would work in that respect. So I think being so prescriptive, prescriptive in Amendment 1 to 2, uh, I, I don't think it... It lends to this, and it would be nice to be able to. I'd like to be able to speak to it more, and perhaps speak to Miles Briggs as well, and whoever else. Thank you very much. Can I, uh, Bob Doris? Just uh, in relation to uh, David Stewart's amendments, obviously a second similar amendment in relation to making sure there's adequate resources and funds available for for training ac across across the sector, which is a. A very important aim, I, I would contend. What I'm wondering if, if one of the underlying issues, and I ask this as someone who's not a permanent member of this committee convener, if maybe the wider 
issue that, that we're trying to get at is a consistency in the quality of training opportunities that are delivered across the sector, irrespective of whether it's a local authority or whether it's a procured service through the third sector. And if that is the desired aim, perhaps this particular amendment is not the best way to achieve that, but it certainly raises that as, as a very important issue. And I'll listen to the rest of the, 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 the debate carefully. Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, I will just respond about uh, Amendment Number 122. I find it quite interesting that we would require registered nurses that might have no affiliation with a care home to come in and decide how a staffing method would be used or implemented, because in support of what Bob Doris says about palliative care, there are many wide-ranging, experienced people across many care care home settings that are able to provide uh, support and care that they need. Some of the care homes in my area have only eight beds and some have 50 odd. So there's a big wide variety of care delivery and I don't think we should be prescribing or dictating or making it not flexible when we're trying to collaborate and look at health and social care integration as a multidisciplinary team approach. We've got some great work being done by paramedics in my area as well. Thank you very much. Uh, can I now call Miles Harper to wind up on... Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Miles Briggs. It's, first, it's a first. It's been a long morning. It, does, <laughs> it sometimes feels like we do see... Miles Briggs, <laughs> please to wind up and press Thank on with door 117. Thank you, Convener, um, for trying to put me off. Um, I have heard, <laughs> I've heard um, the points which have been raised uh, with regards to my amendment, specifically in terms of 118. Um, it was looking to where there's a real lack of consistent data on quality care, and I think that's something for stage three we should uh, be working with the sector to, to collaborate on to move forward. Specifically as well, I think it's important, and I've had conversations with the Cabinet Secretary with regards to the pooling of professionals, and I think that's another area where um, the care sector can move forward, and I think that's something at stage three. Um, I do, in terms of Dave uh, Stewart's amendment, think it's actually quite an important one for the bill and the points which have been raised around this because at the end of this bill there will be costs for the sector to meet and how that's actually um, taken forward um, for different aspects both in terms of private and um, publicly funded care home places I don't think that's clear so um, I think there's an opportunity in terms of stage three to to bring all these aspects together and I hope um, cross party wise we can achieve that. Thank you very much. And do you wish to press or withdraw Amendment 117? Um, not moved. That is not moved. Uh, can I call Amendment 118 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with 117, to move or not move? Not moved. Question. With the agreement of the committee, can I call now Amendment 72 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 115? Moved. The question is that Amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call Amendment 73 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 115. Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 74 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 115. Moved. The question is that Amendment 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 119 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 117. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you very much. That's not moved with the consent of the committee. Call Amendment 75 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 117. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call that is agreed. Call Amendment 120 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 117. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Um, with an understanding that we'll be um, able to look at this at stage three and uh, not moved. Amendment 120 uh, uh, with the agreement of the committee is not moved. 
Call Amendment 121 in the name of David Stewart, already debated with Amendment 117. David Stewart, to move or not move? Um, and, and I think in order to make this uh, an improved amendment, uh, and I agree with the points Miles Briggs says, I will not uh, press this amendment. Okay, with the agreement of the committee, that is not um, uh, moved. Call Amendment 76 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 115. Moved. The question is that Amendment 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 77 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 117. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment one, uh, sorry, 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 78 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 117. Moved. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 122 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 117. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Um, again, for uh, the opportunity to improve at stage three, not moved. Not moved. With the committee's agreement, that amendment is not moved. Call Amendment 79 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 115. Moved. And I call... Uh, Amendment 79A in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 79. To move or not move? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 79A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Cabinet Secretary, to press or withdraw Amendment 79? Press. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 79 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 125 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 115. Uh, Alison Johnson, to move or not move? Um, uh, convener, I, I do believe that in a truly integrated health and social care sector, health and care sector, um, we shouldn't be commissioning places solely for one part of that sector. Um, and I believe that clinical care is absolutely essential very often to, to that person-centred care that we all, we all seek. So I, I don't think this is an either-or. And I think, um, given the comments from colleagues this morning and from the Cabinet Secretary, I will not push this morning, but look forward to working um, with colleagues to bring back an amendment at Stage 3. With the consent of the Committee, that amendment is not moved. Is that agreed? The question, therefore, is that Section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? question is that sections 11 to 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Finally, the question is that the long title of the bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much, colleagues. That ends stage two consideration of the bill. Thank you to the Cabinet Secretary and her officials and to members who have joined us for that uh, item. Uh, we will now suspend uh, for five minutes and then we will resume in private session to consider the rest of the committee's business. Thank you very much.